In the name of the Father, <clears throat> in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Today is the first Sunday of the month of Misra, and it's also the first day of the fast of St. Mary's. Many happy returns. And we, <clears throat> we read about the uh, parable uh, of, we read about the parable of the, yes, sorry. We, we read about the parable of the wicked vine dressers, where um, the Lord is speaking to the Jews and the Pharisees, and he's likening their, um, the way they are responding to him as the Son of God, to the way that these wicked vine dressers are responding to the owner of the of the vineyard who is calling them and saying, send me of the fruit of the vineyard. Uh, and they respond to him harshly, and they respond to all the servants that he sends harshly, and they abuse them. And then finally, um, they, they kill the son that he has sent. And of course, this is a parable that represents how the people are going to treat the Lord Jesus Christ, that God is sending servant after servant after servant and prophet after prophet to the people, and yet the people are rejected the prophets they are not listening to them they are not repenting of their sins they continue to worship idols um, and ultimately when even when the Lord sends his only begotten son to preach and to die for their sins they also reject him and they do not believe in him and um, it says about the Lord Jesus Christ it says about him then he looked at them and said what then is this that it is written the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief of the corner meaning the Lord Jesus Christ is the is the is the cornerstone he is the foundation and actually there is nothing that they can do to stop him there's nothing they can do to overthrow his plans and in the end whatever his will is what will come to pass and all of their actions are futile because there is nothing that they can do to change the plan of God so I wanted to speak a little bit today about the um, characteristics of the plan of God. What is it that God is, uh, how is it that God works? Because we see in this example, in this parable, that the timelines that God has in his mind for carrying out his purpose and his plan is a very, very long timeline. You know, we as human beings, maybe our, our lifespan is at most 100 years, and we are thinking about things in a, in a short time span. Maybe we, we see that in ourselves as being a long time. But in the, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the estimation of God and compared to the timelines of God, this is a very, very short time. When God is speaking this parable, when Christ is saying this parable to them, he's saying all these prophets that were sent to them were sent over periods of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years all throughout the history of the, the Israelites. And yet God sees it all in front of him as one continuous timeline without any breaks. Uh, the people maybe they only live during a certain time they have a certain generation they see part of the whole but they do not see the whole and they do not fully understand the plan of God so I want to speak a little bit about what are some of the characteristics of God's plans so we can help make sense in our minds of the way that God operates in our lives and the way that God operates in the world the first characteristic of God's plans is that the ultimate purpose of the plan is for the glory of God, is for the glory of God. When we read about the story of Lazarus, for instance, okay, um, when the Lord Jesus Christ finds out that Lazarus is sick, uh, it says in John 11 verse 6, so when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. And maybe this sounds strange to us. Like, if the Lord Jesus Christ loved Lazarus so much, this was actually uh, the reading from last week, if the Lord Jesus Christ loved Lazarus so much, why is it that he stayed two extra days? And the way that, it's, that it sounds, it's strange to us. He says, um, so when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. It doesn't say, so when he heard that he was sick, he got up immediately and he went as fast as he could to go meet Lazarus so that he could heal him or he could comfort him or comfort his family and so on. But we know in the end that the reason why he waited is because the Lord Christ actually was allowing him to die. He was giving him the time so that he could die. Why? So that when he comes, the miracle that he would perform would be the raising of the dead and not just the healing of the sick. He had healed the sick, right? But he wanted something dramatic. Someone who had been dead for four days, he wanted him to be, uh, to be resurrected, 
right? And this was right before actually his own resurrection. He wanted to show that he had the power to resurrect. He had the power to raise from the dead. And so this was for the glory of God. This was for the glory of, of God. And so it sounds to us maybe strange, but in the eyes of God, it is for his glory. Another example of this is the man born blind when um, the disciples asked Christ about who sinned, the man or his parents, that the man would be born blind. The Lord said it wasn't either his man, the man or his parents, but so that God could be glorified in him. Okay, so that, so that the, the glory of God could be manifested. Again, this man lived as blind for his entire life from his birth for this moment so that the Lord Jesus Christ could perform this miracle and that God could be glorified. So we see that the, the plans of God maybe are very different, have a very different purpose than our plan. We think of things in terms of our comfort, our convenience, our desires, what it is that we want. But God looks at things in a different way. He wanted his glorification, and why? It wasn't because God just wants to be glorified or God feels good when people glorify him. He wants the salvation of everyone. And when everyone sees the glory of God, then they will seek him and they will find salvation in him and that they will be saved. This is the purpose of why God is seeking glory for himself. It's not like a human being when we want to be glorified, when maybe we are prideful, when we, you know, we want attention into ourselves and we want people to recognize us. This is not the purpose. This is not why God is seeking his glory. He is seeking his glory actually for the salvation of everyone. Because when he is glorified, when everyone sees him as the true God, when we see that he raises the, those people from the dead, then people will come to him and they will believe in him and they will attain their salvation. So sometimes this entails that God's servants and those followers of him go through some, comfort, some uh, suffering or some inconvenience or some pain so that God's glory can be manifested. Just like this man, Lazarus, just like his family who experienced him dying. Um, and so we, we see the glory of God, right? The man born blind, we see the glory of God and how he comes to solve the problems of humanity. A second characteristic of God's um, plans is that they're beyond human understanding, okay? In Ecclesiastes 3.11, it says, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. Beyond human understanding, no one can understand the work of God from beginning to end. Maybe in retrospect, when we look back at some of the prophecies that were um, said by the prophets in the Old Testament, we can piece together some sense of what is it that they meant and what is it they were pointing to. And we see how the prophecies about the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament were fulfilled in the New Testament. But certainly those people who lived then at that time, hearing those prophecies, they had no idea what it is that they were, that they were uttering. Even the prophets themselves didn't know what it is that they were seeing or what the prophets actually meant. We only re recognize this in the New Testament when the incarnation of the Lord happened, when the salvation of God was proclaimed, and we saw how God's plan was, was fully manifested um, at the end. Okay? We also now, in, in, in our day, we don't have a, a very clear understanding of how God is using the present in order to fulfill his plans in the future. Again, this can cause us confusion. We ask the question, why is it that God is allowing such and such? Why did God allow such a thing to happen? Well, again, we don't know, right? Uh, it says no one can find out the work of God from beginning um, to end. But he says what? He has made everything beautiful, right? And it's like a very nice way of, of, of phrasing. He's made everything beautiful in its time, meaning everything that God allows in the end is beautiful, right? Even if it is painful, it, it, it's also beautiful because it is fulfilling the work of God. It is fulfilling the glory of God. It is fulfilling our own salvation, which maybe we need such things and such circumstances and such events, even if they are painful, to happen so that our salvation would be um, confirmed and uh, assured in the end. And so everything that God allows is for his glory. Everything God allows is is beautiful, and it is also beyond our human understanding. So the, the biggest question that we should be asking is not why, because we ask the question why a lot, and maybe there is no answer. 
Maybe there is no answer that I actually will understand because it is beyond me. It is beyond my understanding. The thing that we should be doing in the midst of trials is not asking the question as much as seeking strength from God, strengthening our faith, seeking comfort from God, reminding ourselves of God's presence at all times, and finding in Him comfort. Because it is through in Him that we are able to endure whatever it is that we are experiencing in this life, even if we don't have an answer to that question, why is this happening to me? Which leads us to the third point. Everything that God's plans is for is our salvation. His focus is our salvation. Maybe in our mind, this is not the foremost thing. In my mind, maybe when I come and I, I ask God in prayer for something, I am asking for physical things. I'm asking for things that are in my life that I desire. I'm asking for relationships that I desire. I'm, I'm asking for possessions. I'm asking for healing. I'm asking for prob- you know, the solution to problems that I have in my life. Maybe that is what is foremost in my mind. That is what I'm seeking the most. That is what I'm thinking about the most. And so that is what I pray about the most. And that's the thing that is bothering me the most. And I'm seeking solutions from God about these things. But God actually, not to say that God doesn't bless us, and not to say that God doesn't give us many, many good things in this life, but God's primary and foremost concern is our salvation. Because so many of the things that we ask for in this life are temporary. Many, many things. All these things that maybe we are concerned about, we spend our time worrying about, desiring, and so on, they're temporary. We're going to have them even when we get them. We're going to get them for a short time, and then that time will end, and we will lose those things again. But so what God is actually concerned about is our salvation, the eternity. The eternal salvation is what he um, desires for us. And so we read in the things that the Lord allows to happen to us for our salvation in 2 Corinthians 4.17, he's saying, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The light affliction is the suffering we feel in the world, the persecution we experience in the world, the trouble that maybe we are asking God to remove from our life and that has not been removed. Then St. Paul is telling us our light affliction this, all these problems that we're thinking about, we're concerned about, is our light affliction, is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. Is it, God is taking these struggles, he's taking these sufferings, that in his um, description are light, even though maybe we don't feel them as light, maybe we feel them as very heavy. But he's looking at them as light because he knows that in the larger scheme of things, they are very, very small. In the eternal scheme, they are very, very small. And if we need to go through some suffering for the sake of this eternal glory that we are to receive, then God is doing it for us. And it's not because God is you know, uncaring. It's not because God wants us to suffer. Sometimes people think that God is just okay with his children suffering. You know what? It's just a light affliction. It's like, uh, it's, it's no big deal. Just uh, suck it up and deal with it. You know, that's not how God sees. Anyone who is a parent knows that sometimes parents, we have to do things that our children do not like because it is for their benefit. And maybe as older, more mature, more experienced parents, we understand this very well. But children struggle to understand, you know, where the summer is ending and many kids are struggling with the idea that now we have to go back to school again and it's a kind of suffering that they have to experience. And so for their, in their mind, why do I have to go back and, and deal with all this again? Maybe as parents, we understand the importance of education. We understand the importance of going to school and what does it mean for your life and so on. And so we allow it and we tell our kids, You're, this is a light affliction. Okay, this light affliction you're experiencing of having to go back to school, in the greater scheme of things, it's very light, and what the benefit you will have from it is far greater than the pain you're going to experience now. And so it is not that parents desire the pain of the children, but we allow it, we endure it, and we even promote it because it is a, there is a greater good. There is something even greater. There's another very beautiful verse in Lamentations chapter 3. Of course, the book of Lamentations was written by the prophet Jeremiah after the destruction of Jerusalem. And this is why it's called Lamentations, because he is lamenting, he is mourning the destruction of Jerusalem, okay? And that God would allow such destruction. 
And of course, we know that the reason God allowed such destruction is ultimately, again, for the people to repent and to come back to him again. But we read in Lamentations chapter 3, For the Lord will not cast off forever. Though he causes grief, yet he will show compassion, according to the multitude of his mercies. For he does not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. He does not take it lightly. He does not just say, you know what, I don't really care if people suffer or not, this is for your good. No, he has compassion. He, 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 can, he can understand. He actually experienced pain himself, suffering himself. He can understand the suffering of humanity. But even with such suffering, he says, this is still better for you to endure such things for this eternal weight of glory, so that you will be glorified with me, so that you will have salvation, and that so you will spend eternity in heaven. The fourth characteristic of God's plan is that God chooses those who seem the least qualified. Okay, In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it says, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. You know, we know that God chose, for instance, fishermen to be apostles, not scholars, not kings. He chose fishermen. Mary Magdalene, she was a demon-possessed woman, and yet she became the first one to witness the resurrection, and she became one of the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Moses was a man who was not very eloquent in speech, but God used him to speak with the ruler of Egypt. All the people that God chooses are those people who from the worldly eyes seem very unqualified. They don't have the credentials. They don't have the rank. They don't have the status. They are people who are no names, right? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who were they? They, are, they were just random people. They, were, they weren't prominent. They didn't have any, any, any status or reputation. Nobody knew who they were before they even appeared on the scene and, and that God began speaking to them and telling them, here is what I have chosen you for, right? A great, great mission, a great service, a great destiny that you are going to be for Abraham, the father of many nations, right? He was, he was a nobody right? And so God chooses those people who are the nobodies. He chooses those people who maybe from the worldly perspective are the least known and the least qualified because again, he can be glorified in them. They are the last people. You know, even it says in the scripture, when the people saw the apostles, they were astounded. Why? Because these were uneducated men. These are people who did not, they were, they were illiterate. They were fishermen. And yet, how is it that they accomplished all the things that they were able to do? Right? And so, again, God was glorified in them. God uses those people who he chooses because of their humility, because of their submission, because of their obedience, because of their faith, and then he trains them. He gives them the ability to do those things that need to be done. So this is the fourth characteristic of God's plans. He chooses those who seem the least qualified. Number five, God's goals is different than the goals in the world. And the path of life for those people whom God chooses to fulfill his plans are different than the goals of the people in the world. Most human beings today um, uh, have desired certain goals, like desiring wealth, desiring pleasure, desiring power. These are typically the goals that we see in the people um, that are living in the world. And yet King Solomon, for instance, gives us an example of someone who had attained all these things. He, 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 he had power, and he had wealth, and he had pleasure. He had all these things. And yet after having attained all these things, <coughs> he says in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed all is vanity and grasping for the wind. So while God, or sorry, while King Solomon experienced these things, <clears throat> he can kind of, from the top of that mountain, look down on everyone else in the world and say, I've come to the top, and it's vanity. There is nothing here worth, worth making this climb. There is nothing here sacrificing everything else that's important in order to come to the top of this mountain that is ultimately vanity and futile and empty. There is nothing here for you to desire. And maybe for us, um, our goals uh, as, as Christians is conflicting with our goals as being in the world. 
The world tells us that we should desire those things that King Solomon attained, desire the things that the world seeks after. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ says you cannot serve both God and mammon. You cannot put your heart to follow after riches while at the same time putting your heart to follow after God. Actually, the Lord Christ, he said, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. What he's asking us to do is to give up our life. And giving up the life doesn't mean martyrdom necessarily. It doesn't mean to physically die. To give up our life means to give up your goals. If our goals are conflicting with what the Lord Jesus Christ asked us to do, then he says give up your goals, right? Maybe our goals are not conflicting, right? And we don't have to give them up. But he's saying if your desires are conflicting, if your desires are preventing you from growing spiritually, if your desires are an obstacle for you to enter the kingdom of heaven, if your desires are an obstacle for you to serve others, if your desires are an obstacle to investing in your spiritual life and the spiritual activities that we need to do, then he says what? Give it up. Because those people who seek to, lay, to save their life will lose it. Those people who cling to those things that are in the world will lose it. Just as Lot's wife, when she looked back and, and at the destruction of her home in the city of Sodom, and she turned into a pillar of salt because she tried to cling to the things that were going to be destroyed and that were being destroyed. When we attach ourselves to the world and we make our goals to be only the worldly goals, then it is like we are attaching ourselves to something that is being burnt with fire, something that is being destroyed. And maybe as Lot's wife, in some sense, we are being turned into a pillar of salt, right? In the sense that we are paralyzed from, from growing spiritually. Sometimes we find this, that we are trying to grow spiritually, but we feel frustrated and we feel like we are not growing. And maybe part of that reason could be because we are trying to live two lives. We are trying to make my goals as worldly goals, while at the same time growing in the spirit, getting closer to God, and so on. And here Christ makes it very clear. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. And whoever desires to save to save his life will lose it. So it makes it very clear what is it, how is it that we should live? And, and it's something for us um, to keep in mind. The last point I want to mention, characteristics of the plans of God, is he turns defeat into victory. There are many times uh, in the history of Christianity where there was apparent defeat. Maybe the pinnacle of such apparent defeat is the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is the leader of the Christian faith. He is the one who came and preached Christianity in the world. And in the end, they killed him. And all of his disciples scattered. And it seemed like there was no positive outcome to this movement. There were very few people who were Christians at the time compared to any other religion or, or Judaism or paganism and so on. And so it, it looked like there was no success right at the time. And, and, and the fact that he died and, 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 and all of the disciples scattered, they went back to fishing again. Um, but of course we know that that's not what happened. What happened was is that the, the work of the Holy Spirit through the apostles then began to spread the church throughout the entire world. So there appeared like there was a significant defeat, but in the end there was a significant victory, right? And there are many times where the church is persecuted. When, th when it looks like the, the faith is being overcome, when it looks like all the people are so wicked and that there is no more goodness in the world and that there is complete and utter defeat. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ can bring about a victory and he can bring about victory in us as individuals as well. Sometimes we feel like we are um, so trapped by sin and by the struggles that we are in, unable to overcome them. And yet again, through the power of the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ, he can work in us and change us. In 1 Peter chapter 3, it says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. So the Lord Jesus Christ was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, and granted us through his death, the Holy Spirit in each of our lives. So we are called to um, not give in and not to give up. Maybe we are meek and we are called to meekness and we're called to humility, but actually this is our greatest strength 
and one of the things that God uses to demonstrate his glory and to work in us and through our submission to him. In the world, what looks like weakness is actually a great strength um, that God uses in us, and he turns our sacrifices into victory. So we should never feel like we are overcome. We should never feel like the world is overcoming us, is o- overpowering us, that we are a minority and that people are not. Because God is on our side and God can do anything at any time, whether it be as individuals to overcome sin in our lives, whether through the problems that we have in our life, whether through the church's role in the world as a whole. At all times, God is the one whose plan, again, as we said in the book of Ecclesiastes, no one can know the work of God from beginning to end. No one can know all the seasons of life. Why is it that God allows certain things to happen? In the end, we know that God is in control. We know that God offers salvation to all those who desire it, and the church is open to everyone so that they can come and learn about the way and the path of salvation so they would accept it and they would have victory as well. So these are the six points that we mentioned. The characteristics of God's plan for the glory of God beyond human understanding for our salvation. God chooses those who seem least qualified. God uh, uh, tells us to seek different goals than that in the world. And finally, he turns defeat into victory and glory be to God forever. Amen.